Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Heritage Church and everybody else that is tuning in on Facebook Live or even later in the week. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you don't mind, there's a link in the announcements. Uh, it, it goes to our connection card. It lets us know you were here. If you want to put in comments or anything or give us your information so we can get into a conversation, that would be great. So click on that. We are Facebook Live. What that means is that you can interact during this. We'd like to call out questions and answers and, and talk about all those. Even later in the week, though, if you're watching this as a recorded thing, you can comment, and we'd, we'd, we're still going to get your comments, and we'll even interact with you then. So please share this with your friends. You um, want to just tell you this morning, good morning, if you're our guest, we do welcome you. We want to let you know that our one thing for this month is Easter candy. We're going to be having an Easter event. And we would love to uh, let you be a part of that. If you'd like to be part of that, just let us know and we'll get you plugged in. And at Heritage, there's always three ways you can give. We just thank you so much for your financial support. Because of you, we're able, because of you, we are. Fixing mics, sorry. No problem here, sorry guys. Okay, there hey, we go. Hey, she's back guys, she's back. That's awesome, I'm gonna leave it on the ground behind you. There are always okay. three ways you can give at Heritage. Pardon the interruption. <laughs> <laughs> sorry That's about great. that. Yeah. Um, you can give on our website, you can text 84321, or you can simply drop a check in the mail. We thank you for your financial faithfulness. Because of you, we're able to uh, reach out into our community and make yeah. a difference in the name of Christ in the world. So we've kind of, you know, been talking and thinking a little bit this week. And, yeah. you know, as we go through the week, we're so busy and there's so much going on. We, we come on for our service and then we get offline and then we, you know, a life intrudes. You got to go wash the car. You got to cut the grass. You got to take the kids here or there. And, and, and sometimes we don't think about God again until the next Sunday. And, and we kind of have this little practice that we thought we'd share with you. And it's about asking yourself, where have you seen God at work in the world around you? And so, you know, just ask yourself this kind of thing. And you might have to think on it a minute, but if you think about it, I'm pretty confident that you can see there was a time when you saw God at work because God's at work all the time. Michael, when's the time you saw God at work this week? It's a great practice. I mean, it gets you used to looking for it. I saw God this week, and um, I've had several conversations with people that are just eager, eager, and almost like on fire to serve God and do something cool for God. And that's been absent for most of the pandemic. So, and for good reason, for good reason. But people are just like, they're waking up and they're ready to serve God. And I love that part. What about you? I have been really troubled by Ukraine. And when I see mm. those images, they make me cry. They it's give They give me goosebumps. When you see people, you know, we, a, a lot of us, we haven't seen any images like that of people all crowding into trains, you know, since mm -hmm. World War II. And so when I see that and I, and I see young families and the dad's got his hand on the window and mm -hmm. his wife and his kids are crying as they pull away and just the destruction in people's homes being destroyed, it, it's just, it's so, it's just so heartbreaking. But last night on the news, mm -hmm. and I, I heard this little tidbit of information, and as you know, gas prices are, are continuing really? to rise if yeah. anybody's been to the pump. But 80% of Americans, when polled, said that they would pay more for their gas, more than we're paying right now, they would pay more so that we could help the situation in Ukraine. And I just think that's beautiful. You know, we, we often hear about how selfish we are and everything's all about us, but that to me is just an encouragement that God is at work in the world around us. If you all want to share that on Facebook Live, you can share what, where you've seen God this week. That's fine, too. Yes. Put that in the comments. Yes. And so we continue and complete this morning our message series entitled The Vow. We began this in Valentine's Day, and, you know, that was the time when there were cards and candy and flowers. But if you go to a Walgreens right now, my guess is all the Valentine's candy is gone, mm -hmm. and they're, they're in full Easter mode at this point. And this series, it, it, you know, a lot of times people are like, well, I'm not married. Why do I care about that series? Well, if you're young and you're not married yet, it's good to learn something. If you're engaged, it's important. If you're married, um, who doesn't want to have a, a better marriage? Uh, if you're divorced, you can learn better for the next relationship. And if you've been widowed, you can reflect on the gift that your marriage was to your life and prepare for the perhaps another one to come in, in your lives. So we talked about how the word vow means a solemn promise. We've been reading to you the wedding vows because sometimes we take those on our wedding day and then we don't really think about them again. Yeah. And so for the final time in the vow series, I'd like to read to you the vows we take on our wedding day when we say this. I take you to be my spouse, to have and to hold from this day forward, 
for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. And then we do the ring ceremony. I give you this ring as a sign of my vow, and with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Did you catch that last part? Mm. You know, when we get married, it's not just two people. It's two people, and God is in the midst of it. And it honors God when we keep our vows. And so throughout this series, we've talked about how our marriage should be a priority. And we talked about how God is number one in our marriage and our spouse is number two in our marriage. We talked about how we should continue to pursue our marriage. We, date nights don't end when you get married. You continue to. No. We just had one Friday night, didn't we? Uh, it, I planned a date night. It was a breakthrough in group. Yes, we it was did great. Good. It's, a, it is, it's, a lifelong, it's, it's a lifelong journey. We must pursue yeah. each other in that. And then last week we talked about how we need to protect our marriages. Because if we don't protect our marriages, no one else will. Yep. And as we wrap up this series this morning, we're going to be talking about how marriage is a partnership. And we would be remiss if we didn't mention this. Because when you get married, this is someone you're signing up to do life with together. And recently, we, uh, Monday night, we had a couple come in the building. And they came in the building, and they had one of these bags. Y'all know these, these big, like, Sam's and, you know, uh, TJ Maxx. TJ Maxx. Maxx. Think, you know, think, think TJ Maxx. So they came in, and one, had, one was holding one side, and one was holding the other side. Yeah, kind of like that. And they were walking down the hallway, and... You know, I kind of, we kind of laughed about it, and I said, look at y'all. Y'all are married. Y'all been carrying the load for each other for years. And you know, that's what we do. You know, in the bags of our marriages, as we carry them, we carry the good things in our marriages, the, the times when we laugh, the things, times we've experienced joy, the times when we've, we've been with families, our children come on the scene, our vacations, you know, the, the quiet times that you share, all that. We carry the good in the bags of our marriage. We carry the bad. You know, the times when, you know, things aren't so good. Maybe we're struggling with finances. Uh, maybe we're struggling in our relationship. And, and then we also carry the ugly. I mean, we can be pretty terrible to each other. So we carry that. We carry the, the pain that this world can bring through loss. We carry all that as well. If you think about it, that bag's getting pretty full. No wonder they were having to each hold onto <laughs> one handle of the bag. Yeah. Because you got to put the person in the bag too, right? Yeah. I mean, when you say your vows, you pledge that you're going to take care of the other person emotionally, physically, and spiritually. But you know what's really interesting about the bag? You know what helps you be able to carry the bag? It's what you put in it last. And it's most important. What you put in it last is this partnership. And it's the partnership that will carry you through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because we honor God when we partner with our spouse. You know, have you ever thought just for a second, what, what's the objective of a marriage? What do you think is the objective of a marriage? And there's a lot of different answers to that, and people have a lot of different ways to view this. But, you know, that's our question for you today. What do you think a godly marriage looks like? So what do you, what do you think that looks like? What, what does a godly marriage look like? So answer that in Facebook Live. We'd love to see what your answers are. We'd love to read them out and why you guys are doing that. You know, what do you think a godly marriage looks like, CD? Well, a godly marriage to me looks like one where each partner is doing their best mm -hmm. um, and recognizing that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is in the middle of it. It yeah. can't be all one person carrying that bag. No, 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 because like, you're going to break a handle off. Yeah. Thank oh, God they're strong especially bags. Especially on yeah. those TJ Maxx bags. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, yeah. it, it, it kind of brings up that song, Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. Is that what he's talking about? I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so what, is a God, what do you think a godly marriage looks like? I'd love to, to read out what your answers are. It could are. be hard to quantify, but, yeah. but you know it when you see it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know it when you see it. You know, in my humble opinion, after a few decades of marriage, I think the the objective of marriage from God's point of view really is to learn how to love, to teach us how to love, right? That's the objective of a marriage. I think we get it backwards sometimes and we think that we're supposed to fall in love and then get married, right? You fall in love first and then you, you work off of that love that you built up before you got married for the rest of your life, right? But in Ephesians last week, we read of God's love for us. And Paul was trying to say that's foundational to know how high and wide and deep is the love of Christ, but it's also ongoing, right? And Paul gets real specific on how that plays out in our marriage. 
He says this, and I, I love this as the message version. So it says, husbands, go all out in your love for your wives. He didn't say until you get them married and then, you know, <laughs> back off. He said, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. You know, Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring out the best in her. Wow. Dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. He's like, he takes you right back to the point where you're, you're getting married and put her right back in that spot in that same dress every day. You know, he said, you know, and, and that's how husbands ought to love their wives, he tells them. He said, they're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in Christ. In marriage, we learned that love equals giving. It's a continual emptying of self guided by the example of Jesus, right, for the church. And you don't always have to win. It doesn't always have to be about you. And the truth is, this, if your spouse loses, you lose. Mm. You're one, right? This is a part of you. You're not getting, you know, it's not about getting what you want. It's about giving them what they need. Every day in marriage is an opportunity to grow in your capacity to love. And marriage is the best place to practice love, to practice sacrifice for each other, to practice service, to learn to be other-focused. This sounds a lot like discipleship because it is. You know, if she's okay, I'm okay, right? In marriage, we're one, but we're not the same, though. And the question is, needs to become then, if, if we're going to really partner in love, is how does your spouse feel love? How does she receive love? What does it look like to her? Because a marriage is, isn't about finding the right person. It's about being and becoming the right person for them. It's a journey that you both grow in love. You know, when we first got together, we had both experienced profound losses in our lives. And I think we, we really connected on that level because we could be there for each other in those losses. And that taught us to, to love on a, on a deeper level very quickly. But it had to continue and change because the tragedies didn't end either. You know, right a, year, a few years after we got married, my mother died, her brother died. Uh, and so we had to learn to love each other in that moment through those things. And we were raising a teenager. We had to learn to love each other in those moments because that is stressful. And then we got called into ministry in the middle of all this. So we, and then we got called together. So we definitely had to learn how to love each other in those things. And now we're helping with grandkids, and we have to learn to love each other with the grandkids in the middle of it. And all along the way, the love has grown. It's morphed. It's been shaped by God. It's powerful. It's good. It's holy. But it's hard. You have to partner with each other in this. It is difficult. This is a crucible that's going to burn off the really bad, selfish parts of you. It's good, though, and it's holy, and it honors God when we partner with our spouse in love. Let's see what people said. Let's see if they had any answers. Oh, Angela said, putting God first and seeking Him together in relationship. Give and take. It isn't always equal. Mm, I like that. Lee says, God is first, spouse is second, then family. Loving each other in good, bad, and the ugly. Don't go to bed angry. <laughs> Sean Kaczynski, Kaczynski said, complete support for each other with God at the center. Thank you. Beth Edwards said, supporting and helping each other. Give your whole self to each other, being a united front. I love it. Great answers, guys. Thank you so much for those answers. So Michael is exactly right. We partner with one another, but we also have to partner with one another in submission. Mm. What do you think of when you hear the word submission? What's the first thing that comes, that comes to your mind? You can answer that online. What's the first thing you think of when the word submission comes to your mind? That's a great question. What's the first uh, thing you I'll, think of? I'll let you answer that. And, you know, I, you know, submission basically means to yield to another person. Yes. But when we hear that word submission, how do we feel about it? In how some, do you feel in about some it? senses, it, it comes across like that person's kind of making you submit. And it, it seems like your will is being taken away in those moments. But 
I don't think it has to be that. Uh, I'm not sure. But that's the first blush at it is like, ooh, cement? Mm. Yeah. For me, I go, ooh. Because I've, I've heard, <laughs> you know, there's some, I've, I've been taught different things about submission. And yeah. so, but, but here's what we need to know is that submission is fundamental to Christianity. Mm. I mean, when we say yes to Jesus, we agree to submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus. We are going to do, we're going to try to live our lives the way God would want us to live our lives. We're going to try to love other people the way that God wants us to love other people. In fact, the very first in the, in the early church when people would accept Jesus, they, they had a confession, and their confession was this, Jesus is mm -hmm. Lord. That means Jesus, you know, we submit all of our lives to Jesus. It's just a fundamental thing about Christianity. But if we think about our relationships, in our relationships, we're supposed to live our lives with humility and mm -hmm. love and respect. And you're not going to get there with humility and love and respect <laughs> if there's not some submission. Anybody have any answers? Yeah, a couple. we had a couple okay. answers. Okay. Yeah, uh, Beth Edwards says, giving in to the other person. Okay. Angela says, to me, submit means to give freely. The definition is to, you got any more? Yeah, Crystal okay. Linder says, making yourself less than. Mm. Hmm. Sean Kaczynski says, first thought, doing some something for someone that I don't want to do, just being honest. Yes, <laughs> yes, you, yes, that's me too. I'm like, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> the actual definition of submission is to yield to, to yield to yield to another. But the problem with the word submission is that it's been distorted sometimes. It's, it's been, you know, uh, you know for, it seems like submission was for one part of the peop one partner, but not for both partners mm, in marriage. It's, been it's, it's kind of been distorted. It, it's been mis misinterpreted. But submission certainly does not mean obedience. The word <laughs> submission is different than the word obedience. And it's certainly different than blind obedience. So last week we talked about how in the book of Galatians 5, and you can go back and read Galatians 5 if you'd like to, if you'd like to. But the first part of chapter 5 talks about how God loves us and, and how we interact with God. And then the Apostle Paul, he gets really specific, and what he does is he, he gets into marriage. And so we're going to pick up a bit of what Michael was just talking about from Ephesians 5 the, toward the end of it, and we're going to go to verse 21 where Scripture says this. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Hmm. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Too often in church, when we hear the word submission, the, the word has been told to the wives, that the, that the wives are supposed to submit. But, but I think they've, they missed part of this piece of scripture, because did you see the first verse where it says, submit to one another? <laughs> you see, submission in marriage is mutual submission. So what does that look like? Well, for men, you are called to be a servant leader. And a servant leader, it, it's not a dictatorship. Dictatorship is not leadership. You're called to lead by service. You're called to be the spiritual leader of your home. You should be the first to say, let's pray about it. You should be the first to say, let's, let's get the kids to church. You should be the first to when things go crazy in your home that you, that you turn to God and you help guide your family. You keep pointing up, pointing up. You know, I know a lot of men, they so wish that their wives would respect them. Hmm. And guys, I got to tell you, if you want your wife to respect you, if you make Jesus number one, they will. There's no woman on the world that has a problem submitting to a man when they know that you submit to Jesus. And wives, what, is, what does submission look like for you? Well, it's that servant leadership again. We're, we're, we're to serve. But it's also supporting. It's, it's not easy to be the spiritual leader. And so you can help be a spiritual leader. You can help point, point the family to God as well. And wives, I mean, if you've raised kids, and many of you have, you know, you know what it means to serve. You've done that. And, and submission is just this never-ending circle of each partner putting the other partner first. It goes this way today. It goes that way the next day. Sometimes it goes all one way at, at, <laughs> at a time. Yeah. And here's the truth. 
I know when it comes to submission, for some of us, we just kind of buck up and just look <laughs> at him and go, you're not the boss of me. And, 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 you know, men can be like, you're not telling me what to do. But it's mutual submission. You're both submitting. And guess what? You're submitting to God when you submit to one another. And you're also, you're submitting to your partnership. Now, if you've been married any length of time, you've heard the old phrase that marriage is 50-50. But if you've been married a while, you know that marriage is 100-100. And so many times in our marriages, we get on the right train. We want to be right. Choo-choo. And we want to ride the right train, or we want to be selfish, or we want to make everything all about us. But that's not what marriage is about. Marriage is about the partnership. And the people who have the best partnership are people who understand the power of mutual submission. Putting the other needs before our own. Making sure that in your partnership, God is number one and your spouse is number two. And when you understand this, then you're able to leverage leverage your entire self into your marriage. You're able to give your heart. You're able to give your time. You're able to give your life for what's best for the partnership. And we honor God when we partner with our spouse. Yeah, because you know that other person's got your back, right? That's right. You, you know, that's, it's so important. Now, so we, we, we partner in love. We com- partner in submission for sure. And then we have to partner in covenant. And when we think covenant, I kind of wish HOAs had never borrowed that term because it's got nothing to do with the covenant for your neighborhood, okay? It, it, the way that is lived out has nothing to do with covenant. It's an antiquated word. You find it in scripture. But the, the covenant was so important to God because it was a different way of doing things. He covenanted with Noah. He had a covenant with Abraham. He had a covenant with the nation of Israel. Jesus was the new covenant, right? And even that word covenant, testament and covenant are interchangeable. So we have the Old Testament of the Bible and the New Testament. It could just as easily be called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And that New Covenant ushered in Jesus. And, and it's a covenant. At the heart of a covenant is an agreement for mutual, loving, graceful care for the other person. It's mutual too, right? And, and it's, it's a, in your marriage, you agree to a covenant when you're saying, I do. Jesus was being challenged once. He got challenged all the time. But something about marriage, about teaching about marriage, and Jesus had to set them straight. And he said this to the people who are saying, can we be divorced? And he said, for this reason, he quotes Genesis, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So that they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together in this covenant, let no one separate. And, and what he's kind of pointing to is this, it's this underlying spiritual truth about a marital covenant that you are united. You are completely joined. And most people don't understand the level that that happens until you lose it. And when you lose it, either through death or divorce, you're left with this big, gaping flesh wound on your soul. And you're wondering, what just happened? Well, you just lost your loved one. Jesus is saying we do great damage when we break that covenant. You know, in our world, it's full of prenups and lawyers when when it comes to marriage. And we forget that marriage is supposed to be a covenant. It's different than the contracts you do with the lawyers and all that. It's based, you know, those are all based on mutual distrust. It's saying, I, I, don't, I don't really trust you. I have to kind of protect myself. I'm a little anxious about all this. I need some guardrails in place, some laws, so that you have to pay a price if you back out on me, right? But a covenant is based solely on this mutual commitment you have towards each other. A covenant is built on the foundation of the commitment that you want to make to each other. And... and <laughs> You know, in marriage, it's inevitable. You're going to have ups. You're going to have downs. You're going to have ebbs and flows. You're going to have times when it's very exciting and times when you're just bored, right? But you need to know that the health of your marriage is not measured by your feelings at any one point in time, but by your commitment Mm -hmm. to your spouse, the level of your commitment. And your your marriage will be as good as you both decide it's going to be. It's a mutual commitment, and we need to partner with our spouse because we honor God when we partner with our spouse. Each and every week at Heritage, we take next steps to grow in our faith. And what a great time we've had learning and talking about marriage the last four weeks. We We like the topic. 
Yeah, we hope that you all enjoyed it and hope that you got something that you can activate in your own marriage or share in another person's marriage, someone that you may know that needs, you know, just a little help, a little guidance. We get by with a little help from our friends, right? <laughs> And your next steps this week include, I will initiate a conversation with my spouse about how we can be better partners for one another. Sometimes I'll just ask, randomly ask Michael, you know, what's something I can do for you, right? Aww. <laughs> you know, but, but ask that question, how, how can I be a better partner? I mean, sometimes they need something that's not even on our radar, so just ask that question. And um, we are having our annual Easter egg event. We're going to have it at our campus. We'd love mm -hmm. for you to be a part of that. There are lots of ways that... Um, you can volunteer for that. You can uh, email the office, and we'll be glad to help you with that, or you can sign up in the comments. And then maybe you tuned in this morning and you never began a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you feel far from God. Maybe you feel like you've made too many mistakes. Maybe you feel like there's no way that, that God could love you. <laughs> Scripture says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and there's a God who wants to offer you healing and a God who wants to give you a new life. So if that's you this morning... Please, uh, private message us. Let us know. We'd love to help you take your next steps as you learn about your faith in Jesus. We never want to end a time together where we don't give you an opportunity to do that. And maybe some of us, we need to recommit. Maybe hmm. we've kind of been slacking. Yeah. You know, we've all been slacking during the pandemic. So maybe it's time for, re for us to recommit and really ask ourselves, is God what's number one in our life? And if you need to do that, we will uh, be glad to help you um, take your journey to help you to get re-engaged so that you can um, continue to follow Jesus. And then if you'd like to be baptized, we can help you do that as well. Uh, w just a reminder to you, if you're online with us or if you're checking us out later in the week or some other time, we do have a 9 and a 10 a.m. service on Sunday mornings that is in person. Uh, feel free to come to that anytime you want. If you need to stream, stream on Facebook Live or watch us later on our YouTube channel when we post all these. We love that you're online with us today. Put your prayer requests in the chat. We do put those on our prayer list. Uh, if you want it, if you don't want it, say don't put it on your prayer list, public prayer list, but we do put them on our prayer list. We'd love to hear what you, you want us to pray about. We'd love to pray for you. Um, let us know if you need anything. Like she said, you can private message us on Facebook or email the church, and we'll, we'll get that for sure. So let me pray over us as we uh, transition into the music portion of this, and, um, and our, our worship team is really going to take over and, and lead us in that song. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. I pray the name of Jesus over everyone that's out there, those that are in a marriage that are trying to work it out, those that are struggling in their marriages, those that are on the outside of those marriages, looking in, wondering if they can help. Father, inspire us all to live into this covenant and to support the covenants of those around us. Help us be what you mean us to be and teach us to love in the middle of that. Make us more and more like you and like your son. And it's his name I pray over everyone that is watching this. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Love you guys. Take care of yourself.